So uh, welcome. If it's your first time, welcome back. If you've been here before, let's get to hero myths. Is he going to talk about the Big Lebowski? Yes, he is. I only mention it because sometimes there's a man. I won't say a hero, because what's a hero? But sometimes there's a man. And I'm talking about the dude here. Sometimes there's a man. Well, he's the man for his time and place. He fits right in there. And that's the dude in Los Angeles. And even if he's a lazy man, and the dude was most certainly that, quite possibly the laziest in Los Angeles County, which would place him high in the running for laziest worldwide. But sometimes there's a man. Sometimes there's a man. Ah, lost my train of thought here. But, ah, hell, I done introduced him enough. Sometimes there's a man or a woman, and he or she's in the right place at the right time. And that's the dude in Los Angeles and uh, other people, too. Let's back up a bit, zoom out, talk about the series. So we, uh, we're all on the same page here. What we're doing is myths. We're doing it in the sense of truth, not as falsehood. So. We're not interested in the myths of Los Angeles. We know those. Uh, we, hear, we read about them in the New York Times and the New Yorker. Uh, we are interested in the truths of Los Angeles is another way to put this. But truths in the form of not in, form, in the form of demographics or political rhetoric or any other kind of rhetoric or any other kind of thing, we're interested in Los Angeles stories that are true. And true in the sense uh, not in the historic sense, not in the factual sense, in the mythological sense, in the sense of these are stories that we live out, that shape us as Angelinos, that shape the, shapes the city as the city of angels. We're looking for those kinds of stories. There's plenty of stories. There's plenty of Los Angeles stories. We're interested in the deepest ones, the ones that run the truest. So. Here's what we're doing in this series. We, we've done creation myths and place myths. It occurred to me last time, I hadn't really told you where we were going, so we would start going into the places we were already heading. I wanted you to see where we're headed. Tonight's hero myths. Next week is trickster myths. Any tricksters in Los Angeles? Uh, then we go to myths of the divine. This is Los Angeles as a city of seekers. Uh, that we've referred to and I've referred to constantly. Myth and Dream is going to be about the film industry, the manufacturing of dreams. Myth and Ritual, what do you think the rituals of Los Angeles are? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> You're going to have to come and see. But I have three rituals that we all participate in. I again, in the uh, academic sense of ritual. Water myths. Water myths are in every world mythology, just about every world mythology. Do we have water myths here? <laughs> oh, yes, we do. Apocalypse myths, myths, oh yeah, we have those. Uh, and then future myths, um, what are the stories of the future? So what we're doing here is uh, the Los Angeles stories of the future. What we're doing here is what we would do in a mythology class. If you would were to take a, mytholo a world mythology class, you'd talk about all these kinds of myths because these are the kinds of myths in the world. We're just applying them to Los Angeles and seeing what happens. What happens? I don't know. Um, we'll see. I'm going to depend, as I have all along, on you and your contributions to shaping Los Angeles stories, mythic dimensions of the city of angels, and uh, I think especially tonight, I'm eager to hear what you think the hero myths of Los Angeles are. <clears throat> Just a little review. Uh, we began with the town of the Queen of the Angels, and we talked about how Los Angeles began in the imaginary. It is a city of the imaginary. And, and again, all along, I want us to think 
Well, isn't every city a city of the imaginary? No, it isn't. Los Angeles in Southern California was created from a 16th century novel um, as the land of Calafia, whose followers were called Californians, in a novel. And so the Spanish explorers who came here knew the novel, and they didn't separate uh, the novel from reality and said, oh, this must be the land of the Californians, and here we are. <laughs> I love that, and I think it's perfect for us as the city of the imaginary. We're also the city of the liminal. Uh, and this is what I mean when I say we're the city of angels. Um, this is just me. You can take it or leave it, but I think we're a liminal city. I think we occupy the in-between. I think we always have. I think we relish the in-between. And angels are beings that are in-between, the, the heaven and the earth, the sacred and the mundane. I think we exist in that space. Uh, Los Angeles and the liminal Los Angeles as the city of angels. And then last time we talked about place myths and how Los Angeles, we invoked T.S. Eliot's Unreal City line from the wasteland about how, again, it's a city of the imaginary. It's a hyper-real city. And we invoked Jean Baudrillard to help us with that. There's an embedded difference um, in Los Angeles, an embedded system of differences that goes back to the indigenous uh, tribes here. Uh, as Kevin Starr says in his epic California series, <clears throat> it was a prefiguration of what the city and the area would always be. The Chumash, the Tongva, the Gabrielinos, the other native people in the area coexisted <clears throat> in a um, an original kind of multicultural society. We are also a place to invoke Teddy Roosevelt when he was here, that is west of the west. We are a western city, but we're really beyond that. And more, so this gets at the hyper-reality of Los Angeles. We're not a classic western city. We're not Tucson. We're not Phoenix, thank the goddess. Um, <laughs> We're not these, you know, when you think of the West, I don't think you think of Los Angeles because I think we're West of the West. That's a great book by Mark Eriks, by the way, a collection of articles, West of the West. All right, <clears throat> so um, I want to talk about, last time I talked about place myths, and tonight we're talking about hero myths, but I want to return to one hero in particular because he is so much a hero of a city. And so forgive me for rereading this, but this is Gilgamesh in Uruk from the oldest text in the world, the oldest complete text we have in the world, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And listen to how the hero cannot be understood without the city, right? He had seen everything. Gilgamesh. He had experienced all emotions, from exaltation to despair. He'd been granted a vision into the great mystery, the secret places, the primeval days before the flood. He'd journeyed to the edge of the world and he made his way back exhausted but whole. He had carved his trials on stone tablets, had restored the holy Iana temple and the massive wall of Uruk, which no city on earth can equal. And now we shift to the city. We were talking about Gilgamesh. See how its ramparts gleam like copper in the sun. Climb the stone staircase, more ancient than the mind can imagine. Approach the, uh, the Iana temple, sacred to Ishtar, a temple that no king has equaled in size or beauty. Walk on the wall of Uruk. Follow its course around the city. Inspect its mighty foundations. Examine its brickwork how masterfully it is built. Observe the land that it encloses, the palm trees, the gardens, the orchards, the 405, oh, wait, sorry, no. The, the just see if you're listening. The glorious palaces and temples, the shops and marketplaces, the houses in the public squares. Find the cornerstone and under it the copper box that is marked with his name. Unlock it, open the lid, take out the tappet, the tablet of lapis lazuli and read how Gilgamesh suffered all 
and accomplished all. We know of other cities in their relationship to their heroes, Achilles and Odysseus at Troy. Uh, remember, if it's been a while since you read the Odyssey that it is, and the Iliad, that it is Odysseus who comes up with the idea of the Trojan horse. Wise, wily, not wise, wily Odysseus, uh, Achilles, uh, the great sulking warrior who must be urged to fight, uh, and Troy, the defeat at Troy um, <clears throat> by the Greeks. But then that same city has Aeneas in the Aeneid, Virgil's Aeneid, has Aeneas fleeing, a Trojan fleeing, with his, carrying his father and cheesies on his back, and ultimately found Rome. So these are epic stories of heroes and their cities. David, Solomon, and Jerusalem, fantastic stories of heroes. Um, David, in particular, um, a man very passionate um, and, and prone to the excesses and glories of the passions, uh, and his son Solomon, who found Jerusalem and the temple there. And then Jesus in the New Jerusalem. The Bible actually ends with a description of a new Jerusalem, a new city for us to inhabit. <clears throat> I could go on, but I won't. Uh, I think you get the point. And we talk here a lot about the hero's journey. And, and that's cool, because it's cool. In fact, we have a... Uh, in July, we're going to have a uh, two-week summer camp for kids called Hero Camp that is sponsored by the Joseph Campbell Foundation. Uh, so we're going to teach your kids, I think they're 7 to 11, something like that. We're going to teach them how to find the hero within themselves. Yeah. You like that? Oh. OK, well, it's $1,000. Is that OK? <laughs> It's pretty cheap for camps, by the way. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I'll remember to talk about that more. It, it really is cool. Um, we're going to use art and uh, storytelling and um, painting, and, and we have this magnificent library we're going to use. Anyway, I have to get back to this, but thank you for your interest in Hero Camp. Um, I don't want to go over this too much. We're not going to do too much with it tonight. But we are talking about heroes, so you should know about the hero's journey just a little bit. Um, you see the separation between the known and the unknown there. And the hero who, for some reason, has a backpack, I mean, that backpack's going to be stripped off you by the <laughs> threshold guardians. I don't know why you're carrying a backpack, but OK. Um, fine, take your backpack. Um, and you'll see. The, the known is really the conscious, the unknown is the unconscious. Um, you know, think Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. She never goes anywhere, but then she goes everywhere, doesn't she, in her mind. You have to hear the call to adventure. You usually get some sort of supernatural aid, Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, Glinda the Good Witch. And then you must cross the threshold. This is very difficult. There are always threshold guardians who say, you shouldn't come in here. And they're right, you shouldn't, unless you're really answering the call. Uh, think the bar scene in Star Wars, right? You don't want to be there. Um, and then you cross the threshold and you get a helper. That, that's really Obi-Wan. Uh, a mentor, you go through temptations. And then at the nadir of the journey, you must meet your own death. Uh, that is the most important part. Uh, we're not going to kill your kids in hero camp, by the way, so <laughs> don't, take, don't take this literally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or we could, yeah. right? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is the abyss. This is death and rebirth, where, which involves the masculine and the feminine. You must kill your father here. So Freud was right in this sense. Uh, you must marry your mother here. Uh, and, and you know what that means, I think. It means dealing, coming into oneness with the father principle, which is the principle of order and, frankly, violence um, and 
stricture, limit. Um, you must deal with that. You must understand the value of that force, the masculine force, the mythologically masculine force. You must also marry your mother. You must marry the goddess, really, not your mother uh, so much, um, although the goddess is your mother. But let's not get into that. Um, you must reconcile yourself to the feminine. Um, and if you don't do both of those things, you will not get out of the abyss. Uh, and of course, doing both of those things means that you die to yourself. Um, and frankly, that's what's called for, is a death in the hero's journey, is a death to this old self that lives up there with the backpack. I mean, you don't want to be that guy with the backpack anyway. You want to be a new, well, you've got to kill that guy. That, you've, that guy must die. And so there's transformation. You, once you die, you have known, you come to know what the gods know. So it's just like in the Genesis story. Um, you, you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you become like gods. The, the serpent was right. You do become like gods, knowing good and evil. And even God says in the Genesis story, behold, the, the man and the woman have become like us, knowing good and evil. So you know things. And in fact, you know what the gods know. This cannot be allowed. So the gods usually chase you out, and you must return. Well, actually, you don't have to return. Many heroes do not return. Uh, they just stay there. Um, but other heroes return. They cross the threshold again to return to the backpack world. It should be a fanny pack. Wouldn't that be awesome? Um, and cargo shorts? Never mind. I'm getting into stereotypes, I think. Um, Joseph Campbell, the, the author of The Hero with a Thousand Faces, says that of all this, it's the return crossing that is the most difficult. If you've been on the hero's journey, and you all have in one way or another, just by being born, for one thing, you know this to be true. It's the return crossing that is the most difficult because you must take what you know, and remember, you know what the gods know. And you must come back to this world where people don't know anything, really. And they're small and hurting. And they lash out instead of dealing with their hurt. And, and you know how to fix it. And this is your responsibility. I mean, you can't fix it, but you can teach it. And this is your responsibility as a hero. And it's not fun. I mean, you'd rather be fighting the gods. That's much more fun. The return crossing is the most difficult part. By the way, Campbell gets that, uh, the notion of the monomyth, the single myth. He gets it from James Joyce, who would know, because he wrote the novel Ulysses, uh, which is a retelling of the Odyssey, <clears throat> um, just on a few days, one day? One day in Dublin. Uh, just a guy walking around, living his hero's life in Ulysses. All right, so that's important, um, and we can talk about that, but what I really want to do is zoom out a little bit and talk about heroes and myth in general. David Adams Leeming says, heroes are born when they're needed, during a culture's dark period, often symbolized by the winter solstice. Jesus, of course, born it winter solstice, or around winter solstice. This is the mythological, not the logical. Mithra, born around the same time. Um, heroes are born when they're needed. That's almost right from the opening of The Big Lebowski, isn't it? Um, there is a figure in world mythology called the culture hero. Now, these are interesting people. I was trying to think. I think they're, well, no, they're not always men, but they're almost always men. In fact, they're very often in uh, Native American mythology, they're very often twin boys. And, and there's one of my favorite stories ever. It's the woman who fell from the sky. 
she falls from the sky pregnant <clears throat> by a tree in the upper world. She's been impregnated by this magical tree and she gives birth to these twin boys. They are the culture heroes of the Iroquois people, meaning they teach you how to do things. They bring culture to you. They bring knowledge of how to live in the world. Um, these are culture heroes. Now, it can get very interesting, especially with the twins, because um, one twin might make mountains, and the other twin, the younger, it's always the younger, uh, comes along and makes earthquakes, because the younger twin has to undo uh, the older brother's work. Right? And what this ends up being is a fantastic theodicy. It's a justification for the way things are. Right? Why can't we just have beautiful mountains? Why do we have to have the earthquakes that go along with it? Yeah, that younger kid, he messed it up, right? Um, and then we talked about heroes and cities. Um, th there's a lot to say here, and uh, I've said some already, so I think I'm just going to stop here and, and let you connect your mind with those we talked about. Aeneas, uh, Achilles, Odysseus, Jesus as hero of a city, um, and of course the great Gilgamesh, who is, who is hard to imagine without his city, Uruk. Now, here's something important. Heroes are symbols. The, the, we come up against all the, the, sorry, come up against this all the time in this course, and that is the limits of language. Everything we talk about here, all the words we use, are vehicles. They're not the thing. The words aren't the thing. I know that sounds obvious when I say it like that, but look at the world. And notice how many people don't realize that the words are not the thing. They think the words are the thing, and they'll kill you if you say the wrong word. Or say the wrong words about other words or other things. Words are always symbols, they're signs. Heroes are symbols, they're signs. So in this city in particular, we should be very careful of worshiping the hero, right? Because the hero is a vehicle for us to get somewhere. It's the old Buddhist parable of the master pointing at the moon and all the disciples can do is stare at his finger and not the moon. Heroes are symbols. You know what else is a symbol? The gods. The gods aren't the last reality. They're the next to last. Or maybe before that, I don't know. But the, the gods aren't the reality. They're the symbols too. And we get hung up on the, the god part. Um, I don't know why I have this I don't know what it is. This, it's not an obsession, but I am, I'm so fascinated by the late Christopher Hitchens and him arguing with Christians about the existence of God. I, I honestly don't understand why a Christian or, or any other theist would want to make a philosophical argument for the existence of God. Um, isn't God about some sort of faith, some sort of believing in something beyond, or perhaps even in spite of the evidence. Anyway, Hitchens is, he just easily destroys them because I think they've made a fa fatal error in thinking that God is the final reality and that philosophy or logic is the way to get to him or her. And so I just love watching him deconstruct them. Uh, There's probably something wrong with me, but <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Anyway. Heroes are symbols. We can't stop with the hero. We must, well, we can't even stop with us. But ultimately, that circle leads back to us, that hero's journey. And so we must take the hero as a symbol. Here's one. Anybody heard of Bridget Biddy Mason? Yeah, I didn't think so. Born a slave in 1818, Mississippi. 
Her owner uh, was Robert Marion Smith, who lived in, um, I think he moved them to Georgia. Um, anyway, um, there, was, <laughs> there was Mormon evangelism going on in the mid uh, 19th century, and he gets caught up in it. He becomes converted to Mormonism. So he moves his family and his slaves west, including Bridget Mason. 1848, Mason and her three children walk 1,700 miles to the new Mormon community, which is Salt Lake City. So imagine walking in a wagon train for 1,700 miles in the 19th century. Um, and then, um, for whatever reason, Robert Marion Smith decides to keep coming west and moves out of the protection of Salt Lake City and the Mormon commune there and decides to go to uh, San Bernardino. So he's, now he's out of the Utah ter Territory and he's into the California Territory. In California, brand new state, is not a slave state. You may not own slaves in California. So she meets some free blacks, Robert and Minnie Owens and a few others, and they say, you're not in a slave state, Biddy. You can obtain your freedom here in California. And she, so she sues for her freedom in the mid-19th century. Um, Smith learns about this and um, decides that he's going to move them to Texas, which is a slave state. Um, the, the free blacks that Biddy met, uh, one of them, especially Robert Owens, tells the LA County Sheriff, I know, it, it's kind of funny, you hear the LA County Sheriff and you kind of wince, but listen, um, he's a hero <laughs> this time. Uh, he tells the LA County Sheriff that Smith is holding slaves. Smith heads up through the El Cajon Pass, where the 15 is now, uh, and along with, he gathers a posse, some cowboys and vaqueros, and they stop the wagon train at the El Cajon Pass. January 19th, 1856, Bridget Mason petitions for her and her family's freedom and wins. She moves to Los Angeles. In fact, she moves right downtown, right there at the Biddy Mason Memorial, uh, which is in a little alley off of Broadway <clears throat> uh, between 4th and 3rd. Um, it, you wouldn't know it. Uh, I, I know it because I, when I lived downtown, I just walked all over and um, came upon it one day. I'm like, who is this? And, and there it is. It's in this little alley. She becomes wealthy uh, by buying up land in, in downtown Los Angeles in the 19th century. Um, and she becomes a wealthy landowner and a philanthropist, right? Um, how cool is that? Uh, she saved her money, purchased land, uh, organized um, the first AME church, African Method Methodist Episcopal Church, which is the oldest African-American church in the city. And she told her children, said, do whatever you want, but do not give up this land, because she knew about the importance of land, being a landless person almost all her life. Biddy Mason died in Los Angeles in 1891. Um, this is from uh, the Negro Trailblazers of California with a very long uh, subtitle, 1919. Uh, yeah, it, it's an odd little memorial there, as you can see. It's right in an alley, and um, it's not marked or anything, but what a story. A great hero, a slave born in the South who ends up here by accident and ends up free because of the constellation of events that made California a free state. And her help 
from her friends. All right, another hero of Los Angeles, Sir Charles Spencer Chaplin. Um, studios in the Nazi era here, and we're gonna talk more about Hollywood as we go along, um, but um, they were, well, studios are gonna be studios. They're mainly gonna be interested in making money, and to do that, you have to be very careful with public opinion. So this is from uh, Five Came Back, a story of Hollywood in the Second World War by Mark Harris, and this is his quote. Even as most studios, this is in the 30s, 1930s and 40s, even as most studios maintained a strong financial interest in the German market and continued to do business with Hitler and his deputies, the issue of how to fight Hitler's rise to power was becoming a subject of discussion and discomfort in their boardrooms and executive suites. But in 1938, all of Hollywood's major movie-making companies were adamant on one point. Whatever they thought about the Nazis, they would not allow their feelings or anyone else's about what was happening in Germany to play out on screen. On rare occasions, a veiled or elusive argument against fascism or tyranny would make its way into a motion picture, but it was, it was then unthinkable that studios could use their own movies to sway public opinion about Hitler without sparking instant accusations that they were acting as propagandists for foreign, foreign meaning Jewish, interests. You might re recall that um, in 1939, just to get you a sense of the climate, in 1939, what was the ship called? There was a ship that left Germany. I'm sorry, I can't recall it up. There was a ship that left Germany with Jewish refugee, refugees. And um, I want to say it was the St. Louis, but I, don't quote me. There's a, a ship leaving Germany with Jewish refugees, 1939, and it gets out, and no one will accept the ship. They go to Cuba, uh, they won't accept the ship. They go up the eastern seaboard trying to dock and let the Jewish people off who are refugees from the Nazis. And at every single port, the United States turns them away. And they head back to Germany. I don't know if any of this is relevant today, but maybe you can find some connections. Um, so yes, the studios were being very careful because to talk, to speak against the Nazis was to speak for the Jews, right? Much of Hollywood, this is the quote continued, much of Hollywood's creative class, directors, writers, actors, independent producers, producers, was becoming far more forthright about making its political sympathies known at rallies and in aid organizations, but for the most part, the noise they were making stopped when they passed through the gates and reported for work every morning, unquote. Chaplin himself, says this from his autobiography about the film, I'm sure you know by now, The Great Dictator. Halfway, th this is Chaplin's words, halfway through making The Great Dictator, I began receiving alarming messages from United Artists. They'd been advised by the Hayes office that I would run into censorship trouble. Also, the English office was very concerned about an anti-Hitler picture and doubted whether it could be shown in Britain. But I was determined to go ahead, for Hitler must be laughed at. More worrying letters came from the New York office imploring me not to make the film, declaring it would never be shown in England or America, but I was determined to make it, even if I had to hire Halls myself to show it. Before I'd finished, the dictator, England declared war, on the Nazis, then suddenly the Holocaust began. The breakthrough in Belgium, the collapse of the Maginot Line, the stark and ghastly fact of Dunkirk and France was occupied. 
The news was growing gloomier. England was fighting with her back to the wall, and now our New York office was wiring me frantically, hurry up with your film, everyone is waiting for it. (laughs) And there's a great article on this film uh, in Vulture, and I'll, I'll quote from the article here. Consider the sight of Chaplin's Jewish barber. Um, his, his name is Adenoid Hendel or something like that. Um, Adenoid Hendel. He, he's a Jewish barber, uh, and they think he's the Fuhrer. Consider the sight of Chaplin's Jewish barber comically eluding the cops, as he had done in so many films for decades, while Hinkle's voice is heard overhead railing against the Jews. It's a David versus Goliath symbol for the machine age. The little man fleeing the ever-growing, all-consuming power of technology and automation. And by the way, that's that's an incredible, incredibly important aspect of the Nazi regime is the use of technology. Often gets overlooked because of the bigotry and racism and horror, but they could not do, I used to have a colleague, a a rabbi, he used to give this lecture on the Holocaust, and he would say, he would always mention how technology, uh, modernization, automation, and they couldn't have done that. Now, that's not to say that automation and technology is evil, it's just to point out that with these new technologies, the use we put to them. Continuing uh, the quotation from Vulture, the tramp, is a Jew, the tramp from his previous films, is now a Jew. The cops have become stormtroopers. The movies speak now because this was his first spoken film. The texture of Chaplin's cinema and its relationship to modern life changes before our eyes. His entire filmography gains a renewed resonance and power. Its objects of ridicule may be long gone, but this movie will never die. So, again, I apologize for the total irrelevance of this speech from the great dictator, but here it is. I'm sorry, but I don't want to be an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, Liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate Only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. 
Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man, nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie, they do not fulfill that promise, they never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason. A world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! Can you hear me? Wherever you are, look up, Hannah. The clouds are lifting. The sun is breaking through. We are coming out of the darkness into the light. We are coming into a new world, a kindlier world, where men will rise above their hate, their greed, and brutality. Look up, Hannah. The soul of man has been given wings. And at last he is beginning to fly. He is flying into the rainbow, into the light of hope, into the future, the glorious future that belongs to you, to me, and to all of us. Look up, Hannah. Look up. Um. Film historians will know better than I, but I think that's also a, a new device to look directly into the camera. I think it's been it was done in earlier films, but is that right? Well, and and the genius of this, I think you recognize now. This was 1940, and of course, in in the midst of the Nazi rise, um, the brilliance of satire because he speak, he looks and he speaks like Hitler, he's screaming, and yet he's talking about this utopian vision. Uh, and notice how he shifts when he's talking to Hannah. Uh, it was a remarkable moment, um, a heroic moment, we might even say, where the, the wall fell between uh, the studios and the political, the ability to speak politics at least in that sense and at that time. All right, is he gonna say Jeff Lebowski is a hero? I don't know, what's a hero? Um, the Big Lebowski, according to David Edelstein, the film critic, is a hyper-intellectual stoner noir bowling comedy. Um, but I do think it has mythic material. Um, and the best mythic material sometimes is comedic. For those of you who don't know, I'm sorry, you should know this. Uh, if you're going to live in Los Angeles, you have to know The Big Lebowski. It's just required. Um, Jeff Lebowski, Jeff Bridges, is, um, well, yeah, he's a kind of stoner bowler who goes by the dude. And... Um, what he does is he gets into a classic Raymond Chandler type fix. Where Raymond Chandler is going to use, uh, Philip Marlowe, his character, is going to use very different tools to get out of his fix. His, he's going to use modernist tools such as uh, ratiocination and, uh, and instinct and things like that. Um, Jeff, the dude, is just going to abide, man. Um, and 
And as, he's, he's, as the stranger, Sam Elliott at the beginning and end of the film, says, this is a man for Los Angeles. And we're getting this from the stranger who is, who is a Westerner, not a West of the Westerner, right? So he's the cowboy. He's West. The dude is West of the West, man. He is really out there. Uh, and of course, the film is not just a simple parody of the big sleep. It's a pastiche. It's a layering on of all kinds of things. And if you know the Coen Brothers films, you know that they do this. And, and it's, it's very frustrating for literature professors like me, where, uh, oh, brother, where art there is, about to, is supposed to be about the Odyssey. And I'm like, well, where's the Odyssey? <laughs> I mean, you've got a few little references. Um, I, I read a, a paper on them, and I, I think this is right, that they're not trying to do that. They're not trying to parody uh, other stories. They're trying to just use little pieces, fodder, that critic calls it. They just want fodder. They just want these little pieces from other stories, and then they're going to put them together in this pastiche. Um, pastiche is, by the way, an artistic work in a style that imitates that of another work, uh, artist or period, a medley of pieces taken from various sources. And so, again, if you haven't seen the film, I, I have to apologize because a lot of this is going to sound extremely strange. Um, and I urge you to see the film. But if you have seen the film, you know this, this pieces, these various pieces. There's the Vietnam veteran story with Walter. Uh, who's brilliant. I mean, he could be a professor. He knows everything. Uh, well, doesn't know everything, but he knows what he wants to know, and he knows it very well, like how to get you a toe at 2 p.m. Um, there's, uh, there's Donnie, um, who, <laughs> well, what are you going to say about Donnie? Um, he's a classic passive hero potential who doesn't answer the call. And heroes who don't answer the call usually get killed. And so Donnie's out of his element. <laughs> sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> this is fun. Um, this is Anthony Heffer, um, a critic, writing about The Big Lebowski. And he says this, by reminding their audience of Los Angeles's genealogy as a frontier outpost become Metropolis, remember the, the very first images of a tumbleweed, right? So the West is coming into Los Angeles, and do you remember what happens? It just keeps going into the ocean, right? So something's going on here. We're, it, the message is we're West, but we're a new kind of West, or maybe, again, we're West of the West. The Coens rightly, continuing the quote, recognize the implicit influence of a frontier mythos in the construction of race and gender in the hard-boiled genre generally and in Chandler's LA specifically, sorry. But the Cohen's Los Angeles is an utterly postmodern urban environment stretching from the desert across the suburban sprawl of the valley and through the city proper to the beaches of Malibu. Now this echoes some of the other things we've talked about uh, so far like Rainer Banham's Four Ecologies, the architecture of four ecologies, where, where he has ecologies that aren't adjacent to each other, right? Because that's how they exist in Los Angeles. They're not, they're separate ecologies, but they're the same kind of mental ecology, like the Plains of Id, uh, he calls, uh, calls them. Uh, and then the, uh, it, the Banham's book is Los Angeles Architecture of Four Ecologies, but the Surf Burbia ecology runs from Malibu to Orange County. So as you know, Orange County is not part of Los Angeles. Um, but it is in uh, Bantam's archi uh, architecture of four ecologies. All right, now before I go further on this, you should know, I should reveal that uh, I am speaking as a believer. Um, and so you should take my words <laughs> you should take my words as coming from a believer and in fact a high priest 
in the church of the Latter-day Dude. This is real, or should I say hyper-real. Um, I've actually used this to marry people. It's true. It was legal, uh, and then I tried to do it in Virginia, in the state of Virginia, and they were very pissed about it, um, and, and wrote me back a very nasty letter saying I could not marry, it was a couple of former students, I could not marry them in Virginia with this. So I think we got a lesbian Unitarian <laughs> to, <laughs> to marry them. And I just said some words. So take that, Virginia. Um, all right. So the dude. The dude. <laughs> Don't worry, Donnie. These men are cowards. Yes. I love this because we should be laughing, but this is also a myth. I think it's a Jeff Lebowski, and I think it's perfect that he's a fictional character for a fictional city, an unreal city. I think he represents a heroic, a hero of Los Angeles. Let me tell you what I mean. First of all, he's got to navigate this pastiche of stories. And one of the things we've seen in every talk every discussion we've had is that Los Angeles is, is almost overrun with stories, right? And, and it was that way from the beginning with the different indigenous peoples, but then you get, you get Ramona, Helen Hunt Jackson's Ramona, which is a novel that brings people here to see the characters in the novel, the characters and the topoi, the, sorry, the places in the novel. There are no places in the novel. It's a novel. What are you doing coming all the way across the country to see Ramona's birthplace and Ramona's a fictional character? But they did. They came in droves. And they still do. I mean, they, they still have Ramona festivals here for a fictional character. Uh, and then, remember, what you get is more fiction. You get the boosters who see the Ramona migration and then begin, and then the other tourists come and the tourists are saying things about Los Angeles and the area about how, remember we talked about this last time about how you, you just, you don't have to do anything, you come here and you're cured. And here's the whole list of things that cure you, uh, that you can be cured of. Um, the vegetables, remember, they grow. Remember that, that guy who said if you wanna pick a melon, you have to get on horseback. This kind of, uh, well, it's boosterism, it's myth-making, it's lies, but uh, in that sense. But it brought people here. And so all this of Los Angeles is hyper-real, by which I simply mean it's, it's story-based. Um, by the way, I want you to remember, help me to remind you of this, is to remind you of what happens when a whole bunch of people come to a place for healing. What happens, we'll talk about later, but you get extremely high medical bills uh, as you have to take, the city does, as you have to take care of these people because they don't get healed, right? And that gives birth to other things that we'll talk about. Perhaps some of the reason that Los Angeles has so many different ways of approaching the sacred. Let's put it that way. All right, so first of all, in this film, you've got two Lebowskis. You've got two Jeff Lebowskis, and they couldn't be more different. You, you have to navigate this, and there's a whole scene about where I, I'm Lebowski, you're Lebowski, so what? You know, and, and the older Lebowski, who is really the center of the, the Chandler plot, is is uh, in a wheelchair and anyway, I don't want to get into it. He's just so different from the dude and the dude tries to talk to him and, and there's a rug that gets peed on or micturated upon and uh, the dude goes and sees the older Lebowski and says, you know, I, could I just get you to pay for my rug? And the, he's like, what are you talking about? It's not my, anyway. Uh, so the dude, being the dude, 
gets harangued by this myth, by this American dream myth, right? Do you remember this? It's the American dream myth. Here's a guy in a wheelchair who's multimillionaire, very rich, living in this fancy house, trophy wife, as they put it, uh, Bunny, played by Tara Reid, and, um, and he's, he's giving the dude the myth. This is the myth you're supposed to follow. This is the story for you, Jeff Lebowski. Go out, get a job. Get a job. Do work. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, Jeff Lebowski. So Lebowski uh, puts on his sunglasses and says, fuck it, and leaves. And God bless his heart, Philip Seymour Hoffman is the kind of butler or attendee to the older Lebowski. And, and he says, what did Mr. Lebowski say? And the dude says, he says to take any rug I want. That's abiding. Seriously, that's abiding. That's, that's navigating these stories. I'm serious. Stay with me. Um, there's, so much, there's so many references here. Um, one of the thugs who comes in and pees onto uh, the dude's rug says, Ever thus to deadbeats, Lebowski. Do you, does that sound familiar? It's um, six simpler tyrannus, right? Ever thus to tyrants, right? Which was American Revolution. Anyway, it's also about a story finding you. So when you come to Los Angeles, you have to navigate a whole pastiche of stories. And if you don't believe me, just drive across the city one day and stop. Don't just drive. I mean, Bantam says that the freeways themselves are a whole ecology, but stop and get out in downtown, in Echo Park, in Boyle Heights, in Hancock Park, and look at the stories that just emerge from the places. But I think you know there are a whole series of stories, a pastiche of stories, by which I mean they don't connect perfectly. You must make your own way through them. And sure, that's true of every city, but it's uniquely true of Los Angeles, and we can talk about why. But then a story finds you. A story finds you. Um, we want that money, Lebowski. What? Bunny said you were good for it. This is what the guys who come in and pee on his rug say. And, and then everybody's kind of coming into his apartment and doing things um, because he's part of the story that he didn't choose. And so he has to make his way through the story. You have to find out what the issue is. And the issue is not the Chinaman dude. Uh, the issue is not my wife, says Mr. Lebowski. And then you have to adopt a story. Now, this is, mythologically, this makes perfect sense. The story you adopt, the story you live out, is never yours. You can't make a story for yourself, at least initially. You must adopt a story. This aggression will not stand, man. So if you remember at the beginning, George Bush, George H.W. Bush, is talking about the invasion of Kuwait, and he gives that line. This aggression will not stand. And it's so hollow and, and political and empty. And it obviously did stand for a, for a while or in some ways. Whatever, it doesn't matter. It's a politician telling a story about aggression that will not stand. Well, this becomes Jeff, the dude's story that he lives out. This will not stand. I'm going to go see. And I'm going to show you the scene where he decides he's going to do this. Um, I'm going to go take care of this. This aggression will not stand. I won't say hero because what's a hero? So again, you're not using the traditional stories. You're picking a story, making it work, all the while recognizing in postmodern fashion that it is not an ultimate story. It's not an absolute story. It's a story you're going to use for the moment. Um, so it's a rejection, rejection of the traditional stories. And media, and I, you probably know people who've come to Los Angeles under the story the Los Angeles story, right? I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna be an actor, writer, influencer, whatever. That story does not last. It can't last in the face of the reality of, this, of the city. 
and in the shallowness of the story itself. It's not your story, that's somebody else's. You've got to sort through the stories and find your own, at least at the beginning. Uh, I'm sorry, at least at the end. And then there's a search for unity. You need a rug that ties the room together. The rug is mentioned 17 times. <laughs> Tying to the, that it tied the room together is mentioned five times. They pee on his rug. And it was a really cool rug. It tied the room together. And now he doesn't have anything to tie his stories together. <clears throat> this was a uh, yeah, man. It really tied the room together. Well, this was a valued. Uh, yeah. Tied the room together, dude. My rug. Were you listening to the dude's story, Donnie? What? Were you listening to the dude's story? I was bowling. So you have no frame of reference here, Donnie. You're like a child who wanders into Walter, the middle of a movie and what, wants to know. Walter, what's the point, dude? There's no reason. Here's my point, dude. There's no fucking reason why these. Yeah, two... Walter. What's your point? Huh? Walter, what is the point? Look. We all know who is at fault here. What the fuck are you talking about? Huh? No, what the fuck are you? I'm not. We're talking about unchecked aggression here. What the dude. fuck is he talking my about? My rug. Forget it, Donnie. You're out of your element. Walter, the Chinaman who peed on my rug, I can't go give him a bill. So what the fuck are you talking about? What the fuck are you talking about? The Chinaman is not the issue here, dude. I'm talking about drawing a line in the sand, dude. Across this line, you do not. Also, dude. Chinaman is not the preferred nomenclature. Asian American, please. Walter, this isn't a guy who built the railroads here. This is a guy. What the fuck are you Walter, he peed on my rug. He peed on the dude's rug. Donnie, you're out of your element. Dude, the Chinaman is not the issue here. So who, who? Jeff Lebowski, the other Jeffrey Lebowski, the millionaire. That's fucking interesting, man. That's fucking interesting. Plus, he has the wealth. Obviously, and the resources, uh, so that there's no reason, there's no fucking reason why his wife should go out and no money all over town, and then they come and they pee on your fucking rug. Am I wrong? No. Am I wrong? Yeah, but. Okay then. <clears throat> that rug really tied the room together, did it not? Fucking A. This guy peed on it. Donnie, please. You know, this is the fucking guy. I could find this fucking Lebowski guy. His name is Lebowski? That's your name, dude. This is the guy who should compensate me for the fucking rug. His wife goes out and owes money all over town and they pee on my rug? They pee on your fucking rug? They peed on my fucking rug. That's right, dude. They peed on your fucking rug. So... You, if you move to Los Angeles, you're going to get peed on. Your rug's going to get peed on. You're going to lose what ties everything together. And you've got to refine it. Uh, I'm, I'm way over, so I'm not going to go into this part, but I love the image, right? Uh, that's that's uh, some of the guys on Hollywood Boulevard smoking a joint. No, at the bong in a car. Heroes, right? Postmodern heroes. Um, and then I want to end uh, with the film. And I want you to listen to the stranger and to the dude um, at the very end of the film in light of hero myths of Los Angeles. Oh, yes, man. I'm sorry to hear about Johnny. Oh, yeah. Well. Sometimes you eat the bar and sometimes, uh, you know. Hey, man. How do you do, dude? I wonder if I see you again. I would miss the same life. Oh, How's yeah. things going? I don't know. Strikes and gutters, ups and downs. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Well, take care, man. Gotta get back. Sure. Take it easy, dude. Oh, yeah. I know that you will. Yeah, well, to do the vibes.
I sure hope he makes the finals. Well, that about does it. Wraps her all up. Things seemed to have worked out pretty good for the dude and Walter. And it was a pretty good story, don't you think? Made me laugh to beat the band. Parts, anyway. I didn't like seeing Donnie go. But then I happen to know that there's a little Lebowski on the way. I guess that's the way the whole darn human comedy keeps perpetuating itself down through the generations, westward the wagons, across the sands of time until we... Now oh, look at me. I'm rambling again. Well, I hope you folks enjoyed yourselves. Get you later on down the trail. Say, friend, get any more of that good stuff for me? So, in conclusion, so much to say. Um, here, here's a critic on the film. The Cohen's tumbleweed is no metaphor, but a physical presence that rolls easily and unobstructed from the desert through suburbia into the city and out into the ocean. Crucially, the metropolis offers no resistance. It seems that the postmodern urban environment easily incorporates all these elements into a seamless cityscape and I would add, into a seamless mythology. Any tension between neighborhoods, between the people who occupy them, between the artifice of the built environment has been, well, this critic says repressed. I'm, I'm not gonna agree with that. It is as if the desert, the strip malls, and the skyscrapers and the bowling alleys exist out of their own creation. Um, I think he's right, except that I think the dude abides in all these stories. I don't think it's repressed. I think it's expressed. I think Los Angeles is a city that doesn't repress a lot. Uh, or maybe I'm wrong, but it, it seems to be a, an overdetermination of anything. It's expression. We, set, we tell our stories. We tell so many stories. And I love this ending because what you have here is a symbol of the West and of the old storytelling traditions. Uh, a cowboy who defers to the dude. I, I'm just glad he's out there abiding for all us sinners. Us sinners. He's transcended something, the dude has, has transcended something so that this representative of the older storytelling tradition defers to him. And notice what he does. He starts into his old, old tradition, oh, down through the ages to beat the, oh, sorry. He stops himself. That's not the story. I don't belong here. The dude belongs here because he abides. You got any more of that sarsaparilla? Thank you. I would love to hear your thoughts on hero myths of Los Angeles. These are just mine. Mallory.